Victor Manuel Rocha. He was born in Colombia. He grew up in New York, studied at Georgetown, Harvard, Yale, some of America's most elite schools. He headed the U.S. interest section in Havana, Cuba. He was the deputy chief of mission in Argentina and finally the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. Rocha was a MAGA-style Republican, a through-and-through -through American. But why are we talking about him tonight? Because while he was important for America, he was a far more important man for Cuba. Rocha was leading a double life. He was an agent of the Cuban regime since 1981. That's almost all of his career. I know what Hollywood is wondering. This is a movie script, a sure shot money spinner. But what about the US government? How do they see it? A mole in their ranks for the last four decades and they had no clue. What happened to vetting diplomats? Basically, Cuba won up them. They installed a spy in the American ranks and Washington never figured it out. So how does this work? How badly do countries need espionage? How widespread are their networks? And do we still need humans to spy? Can artificial intelligence do the job better? Hello and welcome. I'm Palki Sharma. On this show, we read between the lines, the stated and the unstated, the obvious and the hidden, to bring you the full story. Now, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you say spy? Ask anyone, they'll most likely say James Bond. He's arguably the most famous spy in the world. Gun in one hand, martini in another, fighting the bad guys. But the real world of spycraft is a little less glamorous and far more dangerous. So let's start with the word spy. By definition, a spy is a person employed by one side to secretly convey classified information to another. And this can be anyone, for companies, for global bodies, for nations. And the concept of espionage is not new. The first mention comes from around 1750 BC in the form of a classified document. Apparently the oldest one known to mankind, it was a report made by a spy. He disguised as a diplomatic envoy in the court of King Hammurabi, a king in the 18th century BC in present-day West Asia. The Egyptians too had a secret service. Then there are mentions in the Iliad, the Bible and the Rig Veda. They're called Spasa or Spash. They were supposed to be soft-spoken, anti-social, people who oust the wicked and protect the masses. Spies featured in the Earth Shastra. For many ancient kingdoms in India, spies were a king's eyes. In fact, Chandragupta Maurya had a wide network of spies. They were placed throughout the length and breadth of the kingdom. They kept him well informed and helped him formulate policy. So spies are not new. But around the 20th century, they became organized, especially under the Soviet and Nazi regimes. The world fought two wars, came on the brink of a third one. So spies were clearly the need of the hour. The Soviets understood that, so did the Nazis. They poured in vast amounts of money into espionage. But Hitler also disregarded a lot of intelligence. In fact, it was one of the many reasons for his loss in Stalingrad. He had information about the Red Army's numbers, the Red Army's movements but he ended up ignoring it. And then there was Stalin. He made the same mistake. He had a spy in the German embassy in Japan. His name was Richard Sorge, often called the best spy in the world. He obtained detailed information about Germany's upcoming invasion. He told Stalin, but Stalin did not believe him. He was sure that Hitler would never betray him. So he shrugged off the intel. He even threatened anyone who took it seriously and the result, the deaths of thousands of Russians, maybe millions. So Soviets and Nazis were spying. What was the US doing? They were late to the trend. For the first half of the 20th century, the US ignored the potential of espionage. They knew it was happening, but they took a moral high ground. Henry Stimson was a US Secretary of State. He famously said, gentlemen, don't read each other's mail sounds like a joke now, given that America is reading everyone's mail. They have one of the most sophisticated intelligence networks in the world and thousands of spies. We don't have a number, no country reveals it, but we have some estimates. Reports say the US global spying apparatus has nearly 100,000 people. And most other countries have their intelligence agencies, you must have heard of them, the CIA, MI6, FSB, Mossad, RAW, the ISI. A bunch of people basically working behind the scenes to get dirt on each other and to keep track of enemies. But countries don't just spy on enemies, they spy on friends as well. 
It's a famous saying, a friend today may not be one tomorrow. And one arm of this espionage is embassies. Diplomatic missions exchange information formally. They also gather it covertly because they all follow one mantra. Information is power, which brings us to the question, how much power is too much power? Where do you draw the line? Does the world of espionage have any place for ethics? What happens when surveillance becomes invasive? You may remember Edward Snowden, a whistleblower who became enemy number one. He told the world how America was spying on its people. Not just Americans, but people across the world. The US was listening to millions of phone calls. It was a big revelation. It shocked the world. But it changed nothing. Spying continues. And what happens when spies are caught? Who takes responsibility? Let me show you some headlines. Two Spanish intelligence agents arrested for passing classified information to the US. Two US Navy sailors charged with spying for China. Gujarat ATS arrests one for spying for Pakistan. Iran claims to catch three Israeli spies. These are headlines from this year. Thousands of spies are caught every year. What happens to them? There's a diplomatic spectacle. It leads to erosion of trust between nations. Allies feel betrayed. There are complaints, expulsions, sanctions, and diplomatic reprisals. And technology is making espionage more sophisticated and harder to detect. But can it completely eliminate human spies? Perhaps not. AI can sift through data and deliver precision, but espionage is a multifaceted skill. It needs nuanced understanding, intuition, and operating in moral gray areas. Can algorithms and lines of code replicate all of that? The MI6 chief says it will not happen. He says the human factor is crucial. But is it worth recruiting AI as a spy? Hollywood did it. Mission Impossible talked about an AI villain. But they still needed a human hero to fight it. And while real life and real life are different, spying is a complex business. You have to take split-second decisions, comprehend human behavior. The AI of today is not advanced enough to do all of that. At best, it can aid humans.